Thanks for joining us as we kick off our brand new series, Just In Time. My dad last week started us off with talking about this whole idea of Christmas and being just in time for the season that we're in. And uh, honestly, I, I watched the message and, and I could not tell you how convicting, challenging, but encouraging it was. And I want you to get a chance to take a look at that. I'm going to build off of that this week. Um, we're in the Christmas season, and uh, a lot is going on, as you know. It is on all kinds of memes, and uh, all over the internet, and jokes, and, and all this, our way of kind of dealing with what's going on, but the reality is, is it's been a lot. Um, I've been sick recently, and dealing with it all, it just is, it's just a season that just seems to drain the life out of you. And I think this has been interesting preparing for this season as we're talking about Christmas because I think a lot of times Christmas feels like the season that is meant to be all about excitement and, and anticipation and, and time together and it's, and it's a season that's supposed to be centered around like joy and, and love and, and it's all these things and yet it just feels sapped for a lot of those things, at least for me. Um, I was marked with the task of, of kind of following up on my dad's message as he talked about things being just in time. I'm going to follow up talking about the importance of joy. And uh, Proverbs 17, says it this way, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. That, if that doesn't, if that doesn't ring true, I don't know what does. Because here's the thing, I think God always has a sense of humor with me because in asking me to, to preach that message, uh, when my dad asked me, kind of gave me the topic, I kind of rolled my eyes. I was just, it just is hilarious. Because for me, honestly, if I'm being 100% honest, joy would not be on my top 10 list of things that I'm feeling um, or that I'm even attempting to feel, uh, especially lately. Joy, it, it doesn't even register for me. I think, if anything, I've felt a lot of frustration, a lot of disappointment. Um, getting sick threw me off of all my routines. Being sick is never fun on its own, but it was, I got thrown off all my routines and the things that kind of just kept a sense of normal for me. And, and I think with that, it was easy to just kind of look around and, and you have a lot of time to think. And without all distractions and, and all the things going on, it just, for me, has felt like a season, if I'm honest, 
that just everything feels pointless. I feel like Solomon, like writing in Ecclesiastes when he just says, everything is vanity. It's all chasing the wind. And I look at it and I'm like, man, there's so, it feels like there's so much truth to that. And a lot of people say he was depressed. I'm like, well, maybe I am too, or I have been, but it's been the reality for me. I, I just don't feel joyful. I don't, I, even in writing this message and thinking about it, it just, I don't want to minimize the pain, the reality, and the things that are coming out in the news and the headlines and just in our own city, the heartbreak, the devastation, the loss, the fear. Um, it's just really real. And I, I, I would hate to be the one who just places this kind of fake, like, feeling of, of uh, minimizing what everybody's really feeling and going through because it's not even true for me. Um, you look around and I just, I, I don't see it. And it is, it's hard for, it, it can be hard, I feel like, to look at the message, the Christmas story, which we read every Christmas and it just gets tied in with just that whole season and it's great and yeah, we, you know, it's awesome, Jesus and the manger and, and the angels and you know, the wise men and all, so cool, all these things, but how, how does it touch the difficulty of right now? How does it touch the difficulties of facing job loss, financial ruin, or uh, and maybe your business is going under um, loss of, maybe your marriage is at an end, or, or you're, you find it just hanging on by a thread. Your children, you love them, and you feel guilty for saying it, but they're driving you nuts. Maybe you're, you're afraid. Um, seeing that more and more people around you are getting sick and maybe the coronavirus has hit closer to home than you're comfortable with and, and you're terrified. Um, maybe it's connected to the political atmosphere and, and the things that are going on and the uncertainty that's connected to that. Um, the things that are, are going on uh, with the racial divide and all, the, it's just still real, all of it. It's all real. It's causing people to lose their minds. The things that are, are happening um, suicide rates skyrocketing, um, accidents, loss, death, it's all around us. It just, it almost feels suffocating. And, and I think I feel it so deeply that I would, I would hate to try to present a message that I'm selling something that I myself am not buying. So I had to wrestle with it, as I do, and as you hear me a lot of times when I preach that I have to sit with it because I, I, have, to, I have to get to the root and, and understand it to know how to present it in a way that's authentic, that's real, that's true for me and it's true for you. And so I've been, I've been diving in. And uh, I wanna just kick off by reading the story, picking up where my dad left off last week. Um, and I wanna read it and we're just gonna take some, take some time this morning and break it down. And so this is what it says in Luke chapter two, Starting in verse one, it says, uh, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria and all went to be registered, each in his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were, were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. 
When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one, uh, to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And, they, and when they saw it, they made known this, the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the story, right? heard it. You've probably heard it a million times, whether you are someone who um, is a part of church regularly or, or fights to be a part of community in that way, or whether you're someone who just, maybe it's for holidays only. We know the story. We've heard it. And I think it's easy to just listen to it and just like, okay, great. But maybe you're feeling like I was and in preparation for this, like I've been feeling, which is just, but really what, what does that, what does it matter in light of this, this present world, this feeling of, of despair, of just being defeated, of feeling utterly hopeless. And, and you may be sitting, listening, and wanting to know how this matters for you. Well, I wanna start off by just breaking down some of these things that, that have stuck out to me and that I've seen in, re in the research that I've done that I want to just share, I think is interesting. One, I want to set the scene. Usually the scene is set with the angels and the shepherds, but I want to, I want to picture it. Um, I, I want us to take a look from where scripture actually starts it. It starts off by saying in, the, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. And, and there's a list of all of these rulers who, who were in charge over the known world. Caesar Augustus was head over the known world and was, ex was extremely powerful. You see, the, in these days, this, this is, is the contrast that we start to see. It, we start off with a list of Caesar Augustus and Quirinius and, and, and then the, the scene shifts. It goes from maybe a picture, maybe you're seeing uh, uh, this scene with Caesar in his palace, in all of his luxury, surrounded by very important people. And he's, and he's got, you know, just his, his people all around him and, and they're lounging and they're, they're warm and, and they're, you know, they're just comfortable. They're in control. They're in power. They're, they're having a census to bring about taxes and you see Quirinius, the governor, and, and these people that are high up, significant. They matter. They're important. And you expect that a scene where that something so important is going to take place, these would be key characters. But the scene, the scene shifts. And as it does, we go straight out to a field in the middle of a no-name town where there's shepherds and sheep in the middle of the, of the evening. And it's this, this contrast that in this field, in Bethlehem, these shepherds are hanging out. Shepherds were not highly received. They couldn't even give testimony in court. They were, they were not people who were seen with high regard. They were actually considered pretty lowly. Pretty, they, they weren't wealthy. And uh, they're here outside with their sheep. And, and this is a moment that all of a sudden, suddenly, out of nowhere, an angel appears. Now, consistently throughout scripture, when an angel appears, they have to say, to fear not, do not be afraid. I can't even imagine what it would look like to see a supernatural being. I, I, don't, I can't even comprehend that. If a supernatural being showed up in my room last night when I was prepping, um, I, I probably, one, would feel crazy. I probably, two, would pee myself. I, I, I think there would be any number of just like responses. But fear, I think, is a natural response to just being like, I, yeah, my mind can't comprehend. It can't wrap itself around this situation that's taking place right now. This does not make sense. But the spiritual being, this angel, did not show up 
to the ruling class. It didn't show up in a palace to declare the most significant moment in history. It went to shepherds. Now that may seem insignificant to you, but I think it matters a great deal. Um, because for one, there's so much layer. If, if you start doing research in scripture, I love there's so much like symbolic importance underlying some of this that, that the Jewish community, the Israelites knew and understood, but I think we miss in our culture, in our, in our context, where it's lost to us. But the reality is, is these, these shepherds are hanging out, watching their flocks at night in Bethlehem. Now this is significant because you, it's a nod to King David who started out this lowly shepherd boy. Before he was pronounced king, before he was anointed, he was, he was this shepherd boy who spent times, we have psalms of his, his songs that were written in these fields, these very same fields, some of them perhaps, where he wrote and connected with God intimately, where he protected his flock from, from bears and lions. This, this no-name insignificant boy became ruler, the uniter of Israel during the golden age for Israel's lineage. So important that it was promised that the Messiah, the one who was to come that would free the people of Israel was going to come through David. Now we find ourselves back in Bethlehem, in the fields with the shepherds. And yes, they're insignificant. They're, they're not even named. And yet you see this picture of what is seen in obscurity, in this place that seems insignificant, unimportant. See, I think part of what, what, why that matters so much to me is I think when the problems of the world seem so big, when all the turmoil and all the chaos is so overwhelming, it's hard not to just feel insignificant, to feel like you're, what, what is the purpose of your life? What, what, matter, what matters um, most? What, what, what place do you, like, what part do you play in all of it? I, I think I find myself just being like, man, I can't change anything. I can't control anything. I can't determine the outcomes of what's going on. I, I, I just feel so helpless. I feel, I, I feel like we're just here, just kind of trying to get through it, trying to make sense of it all. But I love it because as the scene shifts, it's not with the elite that God makes his son known. It is amongst lowly shepherds. And we see that while they, we, we get a picture of Joseph and Mary on their way back to Bethlehem, where he was brought up or, or where his lineage comes from, they registered and, and Mary had her kid in this, you know, potentially in this little uh, cave or, or barn of some kind that just super lowly, you know, in, in with royalty, it's important, the significance of a, of a baby that, that is going to be um, the next in line to rule, it would be a, they would make a big deal. You, you would want to express every bit of, of your wealth. It, you would want it, this baby to be surrounded by the most important people. Why? Because it's all, it all is a symbol of value. The value that is placed on this child uh, value is shown and expressed by the extravagance of the wealth, the, the, the significance, the importance of the people that are surrounding it. These are all signs that this child matters. And yet, Jesus isn't born in those places. He's born in obscurity. It's just so ironic and yet so appropriate. Because then it goes, the, the scene shifts to these shepherds, no-name shepherds, no relation that we know of, no, no connection to Mary and Joseph as they're back in Bethlehem. She has this baby and the angels come, the angel comes to shepherds 
in a field. And in the same re- region, it says, there were, there were shepherds out in a field keeping watch over their flocks by night and an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord showed around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy. You see, this, this to me is, is equally interesting because as I was wrestling with this message, as I was prepping for it, um, I found myself just, if I'm honest, just thinking, God, this is a great message when life is good and when we're happy and when we're surrounded by family and friends and we're getting to go out and, and do the presents and, and get ready for Christmas Eve and all of these things. But it seems so disconnected from where we are right now. But I love that the scene is, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that the scene takes place with the shepherds, with their flocks at night. Because you see, I think night is the perfect backdrop for light. And it feels, I feel, it feels very dark in our season. It feels very dark in, in the world that we live in. The current context feels, it just feels like darkness all around. Maybe you can't see the future. You're not, you're not sure what is to come for you, for your family, for your job, for where you feel the, like you should be living or, or what you should be doing. Or maybe you find yourself just questioning a lot and it just feels dark as you read and listen to the news or you listen to um, the people talking around you, the arguments, the, the discussions, the, the frustration. It's dark. But darkness is the perfect background, the perfect backdrop for light. And when the angel came, he was surrounded by the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. This is a beautiful moment that I think is symbolic of of not just that very situation, but the fact that their world, just like ours, it was just existing. It was just happening. They'd been waiting. God had been silent for so long. Maybe you feel God is silent for you in your world, in your moment, in your life. He just seems so far off, distant, and silent. There is no light at the end of the tunnel, as they say. There's no light at all. And you're, you're struggling But he says, fear not. My dad touched on this last week, but the importance in a season where I think fear is crippling people. Fear is destroying lives, destroying relationships, destroying all the things that we see around us. We're told to fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. This is the verse I was wrestling with because here is where joy is pronounced. Joy. In the midst of all of this, joy. Joy. Knowing that soon after there would, there would be a mass murdering of children under the age of two in order to try to wipe out this new king that there was a fear that he would overthrow the government and so children were, were murdered. Joy. How? How? How do we find joy in the midst of this? How, what is that? How do, how do you even reach that? How do you touch that? What is it that we're, we're supposed to find joy in? How, how do we experience joy? You see, for me, it just... It, as I was reading it, it just fell so flat, if I'm honest. And I know probably just sounds super unspiritual, but it's the reality. It it is what I have, as I prepped this message, it's like, but God, joy, it's great. The message, this whole story is great, but how does it connect? What, What does it mean for now? But I love this because for one, the, the literal translation of bringing good news, uh, the angel 
it, it, in essence, is saying, I evangelize to you. It's where we get the word gospel from, this idea of good news. And the first evangelist was an angel, this supernatural being, the very first proclamation of the good news was to shepherds, humble and lowly. And potentially, you know, in, in the big scheme of things, insignificant. And yet, this is the chosen audience for this message. Good news of great joy that will be for all the people. It's, it's a message of joy. What is the message? That in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, is born this day. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. A Savior. Someone who has come to save. This is language that the Greeks would have used for Caesar Augustus for the, those in the ruling class, for those who were in charge, those were in, who were in power. Who is Christ? Christ uh, is the Greek term for the Hebrew word Messiah, which means the anointed one. Anointed one. David was anointed when he was made king. Saul was also anointed when he was made king. There was anointing that took place for those who were chosen to do something for God that were set apart for the will of God. Who is Christ the Lord and Lord. Lord was a term connected directly to God himself. Powerful Lord over all. This was the terminology placed in the hands of this little baby born in obscurity. And this will be the sign you will find this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. Not that weird. Most babies are wrapped in cloth and, and are, it's used for warmth and protection. And, and you, know, you wrap your arms in and it, it helps soothe them. But here was the weird part. It was lying not in a palace, not in, in a hospital bed, not not anywhere else but a manger, a trough. And this is what, this was the, the scene that was set. This was what was chosen to be the course of action. You see, I sat with this and I'm like, okay, God, what, what help me with this. But as I sat with it, I realized this was the exact point who the message was sent to, what the message was. You see, the, the, the shepherds are a representation of us, really. If Jesus was born in a palace, which he very well could have been, he had every right to be born wherever he wanted. There would have been no access to him by any common person. You would have had to have title to be connected to someone of importance. There would have been no way to get through the gates. There would have been no way to access this Jesus, this baby, this ruler who was coming to set the world free. There would have been no, no ability to reach him, to connect with him. You know, and you see with, ruling, with the ruling class, they almost are like mythical creatures. It, it, it's, there's a mystery surrounding them because most most common people will never in their lifetime see or meet the king, meet the prince, be in contact with, why would they? There would be no reason for them ever to be in a situation where they would rub shoulders with, talk to, connect with, make eye contact with, be seen by the king. They would not have ever been known by the king by the prince. And so Jesus was born not in this palace, in this place that would have been a natural atmosphere and environment. The scene would have been appropriate. It would have been appropriate for him. But the access was open to all, to the lowliest of shepherds, 
because he was born in a barn. There was no guards. There was no, there, there was no one there to keep them people at bay, to keep them from, of, from contacting, from seeing, from being seen by. And this sets the stage for, for the ministry of Jesus. But see, this is for us. You and I are the lowly, the shepherds, the, the seemingly insignificant, the invisible, the humbled. See, it is for the poor in spirit that this message matters most. Don't you see? In our context, in our time, this is us. I'm not saying it's not for the ruling class and it's not for those in power or in control. I mean, we're in the top 1% of the world's wealth. So really that we would be out. But in your life, you may feel that feeling of, of being invisible, of being unseen. Maybe you feel like God is far off. He's not listening to your prayers or you feel like your circumstances are, are extremely bleak. They're difficult they're uncomfortable, you feel unseen, unheard, but this is the message. It is for you, it is for me, for the invisible, the unseen, the unheard. Not for those who are famous, not for those who have wealth, not for those in, just in power, not those alone, but for us. Why? Because access is given to all, access is given to you, to me. What is that access? It is the access to the King. Emmanuel, God with us, is here in your dark moment and the light, the backdrop of darkness can now be contrast with this light in your current moment, in your current circumstance that the ruler over all has been born, that he has made himself easily accessible. Do you feel unworthy? Have you seen through the, this season it has a way of squeezing the ugliness right out of it so that it surfaces, the ways that we cope? Have you seen ugly come out of you? Your, your shame and embarrassment as you have not handled situations maybe in a way that, that you feel proud of. Maybe you see sin oozing out of you as you cope and as you deal and as you handle this, the uncomfortability, the pain, the, the fear, the shame is all too real and maybe you feel like this message, message is inaccessible to you. But the history of the shepherds and all of that was, it was irrelevant. It wasn't the point. It was the fact that these mediocre, average, everyday Joes were the ones that were proclaimed the message by this angel. And they were the ones who had the first opportunity to go and see not the senators and, and the leaders and the ruling class, not the wealthy or the famous, the well-known. It was the invisible. These shepherds who probably would never see Jesus in his time of, of ministry, when he actually began his ministry 30-something years later, he would not, they wouldn't even see potentially. And yet they got to experience this first. It is significant because what God is constantly drawing the story back to is this nod to David, a lowly, invisible, unimportant boy. Nothing to offer that becomes king and ruler over all. These shepherds who are invisible, unseen, insignificant, incapable of bringing change to their world, their circumstances, walking, just doing their job, trying their best to get through, dealing with their everyday struggles, hoping to just survive. You and me, everyday normal people that may feel 
insignificant. Like our problems just don't quite add up on the big scale, on the, on the, you know, the big picture. But fear not, for there is a message of great joy. A Savior, Messiah, anointed one, the Lord, he's come. I love, the, I love that uh, it fast forwards and it shows the shepherds go in and, and they immediately go. It says in verse, uh, verse 15, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened with the Lord, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. I think it's so in- interesting that though the, the angel was the first evangelist, the shepherds become the next evangelist. We don't even know their names, and yet they become the evangelists, the proclaimers of the gospel, the good news that the Savior has come to save us from sin and death and darkness and hopelessness. See, joy is the character trait of the Christ follower. Scripture lets us know that we are characterized by our joy. We will be identified by our joy. It becomes not just a feeling, though it is a feeling, but it is, it's it's a character trait, it is a quality possessed by those who are connected to God. All who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. One commentator wrote it this way. I love this. He said, gospel is coming. Good news. Gospel elicits joy, not fear. Joy is the inward feeling of happiness and contentment that bursts forth in rejoicing and praise. Joy comes not just to lowly shepherds or isolated parents far from home. Joy comes to all people in the most unlikely place amid the most unlikely spectators. God brushed aside the world's fears and provided the world reason for joy. Joy centers not in something you earn or possess. Joy comes from God's gift, a tiny baby in a feed trough, but a what a baby. This is the joy. One, it is not just the fact that God sees you now and this message is for you, that there is joy, there is hope, that this, it, no matter what you find yourself in, no matter how you've handled this year, no matter how far from God you are, no matter how dirty, unworthy, unclean, no matter what you find to be your current circumstances, there is joy available to you. Now see, this is the interesting, this is the caveat, is joy is directly connected to Jesus, to our relationship with God. Saying, in in other words, you can experience joy only with God. It was a reality check for me to realize I must not be experiencing joy because I must not be experiencing Jesus. I think this is significant to recognize that our joy is connected to our relationship to Jesus. How close you are in proximity to Jesus determines your ability to experience true joy. Happiness and joy are completely different. Happiness is all circumstantial. Joy is something that is experienced, yes, in beautiful moments, but it goes beyond. It it surpasses, it transcends our circumstances, because joy is not just connected to what God is able to do just in time, in this moment in history, because he is. I love that my dad said and talked about the slowlies, bringing about the suddenlies, that it seems like there is nothing, there is no hope, that that you look into the future and there is nothing but darkness. And in a sudden moment, an angel appears in the middle of a field and talks and proclaims the good news to the shepherds. 
They could have anticipated it. It happened suddenly, so suddenly. And they were filled with joy. Suddenly. See, the, that the, our circumstances can change in an instant. God can bring about life and hope and change ex nihilo out of nothing. He doesn't need our help. We see that throughout biblical history. But beyond that, there is this guaranteed promise that because this happened, that Jesus was born, that these, these shepherds saw it, that it was in a historical moment that he fulfilled all of the prophecies that had been spoken long before, that the prophecies that speak of his return will also come to pass, that we have a guaranteed promise. And it, could, and it will happen suddenly, and we don't know when. And an angel will come and proclaim his return. You see, the response of the shepherds as they experience Jesus is that they, it says they returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. I think our response in this season, if we want to experience joy in the midst of this, in the midst of a Christmas that maybe you didn't anticipate and it feels like it's impossible for you to experience joy because of the loss or the stress, the anxiety, the fear, is to get with Jesus. Maybe it sounds oversimplistic. Maybe it is. But I believe it's true nonetheless that we worship, that you worship. So much of the time, for those of us who have engaged in a relationship with God, it looks like a couple who sits at dinner and you watch them and they never look at each other. They never connect or communicate. They're both on their phone scrolling through and it just, they're there and they take the time, but it is meaningless. There's no intimacy, there's no connection, there's no feeling of us-ness. And I think a lot of times we approach time with God the exact same way. We go through the motions, we set the time aside, we sit, but we don't fight for intimacy, for connection. And I believe that that is found in worship to place our mind and our hearts on Jesus, whether that is meditating on these verses, on this story and sitting with it, going to something, a resource and looking up commentaries on what this means and how it relates to you. Maybe it's uh, journaling and, and putting on worship. Go close your door, sit in your room, go to your car, like take a drive. But worship, worship draws our eyes back out of our circumstances and back to Jesus. It is what Paul and Silas did in the middle of a prison cell after being beaten and are, and are sore and uncertain of what's to come. And they sat in those cells and they worshiped in the midst of their circumstances. Oh, that we would be a people of worship. See, this message is not for when life is good and for when the Christmas season, when we feel like the Christmas season and we feel the excitement and the anticipation and we feel it, it is precisely just in time for this moment. When do you need joy most than when it's farthest away, when it seems the most unreachable, when it seems the most bleak and the most dark, but this is the hope, this is what brings joy, is that this message is for you. You are able to access the King, Emmanuel God with us, Christ the Lord, the Savior, easily without guards, without going through all the, the motions and trying to make yourself better and cleaned up and pretty enough and, and, and to remove all the stains and, and all the shame and all the guilt, to go to him honestly, to go to him humbly and to find that the good news is for you, that he is here to set you free that he is here to walk with you through your uncertainty, 
your fear, your pain, your loss. He is here to walk with you, to live with you, to be in it with you. And as we go through it, he also promises to come back and to wipe away sin and death once and for all, all of the brokenness, all the cruelty, all the ugly, all the hypocrisy, once and for all will be gone. But in the meantime, this message comes just in time. Because it comes to you as you sit in your living room or in your bedroom or wherever, it comes to you now in the midst of 2020 when it seems the most dark. And see, when we are able to walk with joy, we once again can look out of the bleakness of our circumstances and see those around us. And we got to be a part of something. Love, or I love the way that Psalms in 126 verse 5 says, those who sow in tears shall reap shouts of joy. We're, gonna, we're, we're going through seasons and maybe you're, you're feeling the tears, but you're sowing nonetheless. You're sowing into your relationship with God even if you don't feel joy right this minute. But, but you will reap. There is joy coming. And, and I want to just kind of close with kind of just encouraging you. We as a church have been able to, we, we always do a Christmas chill for the teenagers in the foster care system. And obviously with COVID, we haven't been able to do that traditionally the way we would with a big party and all the things that we like to do. So instead we put together huge boxes, thanks to Chick-fil-A and, and uh, so many people that gave their time and donated, many of you, um, we were able to put Christmas gifts, huge boxes together and we wrapped them and and took them to DCFS in Palmdale and got to send them out to students. And there was a text message that was sent to my mom by one of the social workers, and this is what it said. It says, hi, Lori, I just have to share with you the happiness these Christmas presents have brought to these kids. Oh, how I wish your church could see. They have loved them so thoughtful and so well put together. I have enjoyed giving them out and telling them who they are from from me and all of my kids on my caseload. Thank you. Another social worker that talked to my mom said when she gave it to one of the girls, the girl said, wow, they must really love us. Look at this gift. And the social worker was so overwhelmed with joy that she got to be a part of just giving the gifts. See, maybe you're not experiencing these moments, but your sacrifices, your, the gifts that you're giving, the, the ways that you've donated, whether it's time or money, and just being a part of this moment, you are proclaiming the good news of worth and value on the seemingly invisible, unseen, those who feel insignificant, we are a part. And this is the thing, y'all. It is not just about being spiritual in this season and trying to fake emotions that don't exist. I'm not asking you to do that. Go honestly to God. Sit before him honestly and pour out your heart. Pour out your pain. Pour out your fears and your feelings and let him comfort you because he is a king that is near. Christ the Lord born in a manger, and all of this to prove the same point over and over and over and over that the message was not just for the elite, not just for the clean, not just for the super spiritual, not just for those who have their crap together. It is for the everyday average Joes struggling with, with all kinds of unhealthy habits, coping mechanisms, addictions, who find ourselves dealing in ways that feel less than the person we want to be, gossiping, judging. And yet, Jesus comes to us and says, I got, I got something for you. And it will bring you great joy. But we find it in him. And as we do, we spread it. You become 
the next in line after the angels and the shepherds and those who have gone before us. You become an evangelist, a proclaimer of the good news of the gospel. And you simply are doing this by sharing your own experience, what God has done in your life. Maybe you find yourself hopeless today. I want to pray as we close. Maybe you find, or I started out with the verse in Proverbs, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Maybe you feel dried up. I want to pray for us. You see, for me, as I've sat with this message, I got overwhelmed. One, by just the fact that God is that good, that he would meet me in my room as I prep and as I worshiped, that it mattered to him. That at the same time, while he is, that he, as he is working in government and in the world systems and, and working through all the things that are going on on the big picture, he is invested and interested in the individual. In those who seem invisible, insignificant, who feel like they have no value, no purpose, that it all seems meaningless. Their life seems meaningless. I want to pray for us. Because the message, through the words, through the, the scenes that were set, through those who it was communicated to, are all pointing to the same fact, that it is good news for us right here, right now, just in time, for a very, very dark world and a very dark season in our, in our history, in our lives. That it doesn't have to be. We can still hope. We can still walk with joy in anticipation, that we can still celebrate the birth of Jesus and we can still live filled with anticipation. Let's pray. Jesus, I do not want to minimize the pain, the loss, the fear, the hurts of people who are going through it in this season, for those who are struggling with deep depression, with anxiety, for those who have lost in this season. God, I just lift them up to you and I pray that you would Make yourself known to them in a powerful, tangible way that they would experience your presence, that they would experience your glory. God, I pray that this would begin to just encourage those who find themselves far off, who have maybe just drifted far from you in this season as they've just tried to do their best to get through, to numb out, to not feel, to just deal with it, that they would be drawn close. Jesus, I just pray that you would be with the families who are, are hurting right now. Jesus, I pray that we would be marked by our joy, that, that we would see that this bleak season is the perfect backdrop for joy, for your light to shine. Jesus, give us each a revelation of what this means in our lives. Let us come to you. Let us cling to you. Let us worship you. Not waiting for a church to open and, and the need for music and lights and sound and all those things, God, to, to get in the mood, to get the feeling right, God, that we would just go to you. That we would cut away all of the excess and that we would just sit with you, be with you, worship you, and that in so doing, you would place joy inside of us. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for this message. We thank you for your son. We thank you that we get to celebrate with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I read the text messages and I told you about the party, but I just wanna thank you, Journey Church, for your generosity, for always being a part. You have impacted more than 120, 130 kids' lives who we were able to give gifts to, that were, we were able to hand to the social workers and they were able to put in the hands of these kids to experience a party where we were able to give away more than 30 um, raffle gifts and prizes. It's your generosity. It's your, your guys' hearts. And I pray that you would experience the joy that comes with giving, with loving, with being the hands and feet of Jesus and by proclaiming the gospel, the good news, not just with your mouth, but with your actions. We love you, Journey. 
We miss you. We look forward to seeing you again soon. And we hope that you are doing well. We look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good one. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not Now